So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him. Notice that it was a continuous thing. It says they kept asking. The, the picture I'm getting here is like a kid who keeps on asking for, for a toy at the, at, the, at the store or for a snack, right? It's, they're just they're nagging. They keep on asking. And they asked him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after this saying, Jesus, he, was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into the heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return. Say that with me. He will return. One more time. He will return. He will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Today I want to talk to you. I'm going to finish talking to you about, about the signs that signal the return of Christ. The things that we can be looking for, uh, for that are happening around us that are a sign to us that Jesus Christ is about to return. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say, watch out. Come on, say, watch out. Watch out. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Father, our hearts are open and ready to receive, remove any obstacle, any hindrance. But, Lord, we focus on you. And, Lord, I pray at the end of service today that people would give their lives to you, Lord, in a powerful in an intimate and in an amazing way, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody says, amen. You may be seated today. A couple of weeks ago, I started this message talking about the return of Christ. The return of Christ. A lot of people wonder about this. It's about, you know, about the return of Christ. Is this something that even Jesus talked about? These two angels told the disciples, told those who were gathered on the, at that place, and, and he said to them, he said, hey, why are you looking up at the, the skies? Why are you looking up at the heavens? He goes, the same way that you saw Jesus taken from you, it's the same thing, it's the same way that you'll see him return. In other words, he will come from the heavens. And so for Christians and for followers of Christ, we've been, we've been, we've been taught that one day, we, one day that Jesus will return. I've been hearing this all my life. I've been hearing this since I was a child. It's probably one of the first things that I heard growing up. Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back. And so a lot of people ask themselves, okay, if Jesus Christ is coming back, what, when is he coming back? And, and, and is that true? Is that something that, that we can really talk about? Is it something that we can know? And, and so over the last several weeks, uh, to, or actually two weeks ago, I talked about a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. Now, if you have your, your phone or your tablet or, 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 or an old-fashioned way, your Bible there, I'm going to invite you to open your Bible there to Matthew 24 because Jesus, what, what better way to know about the return of Christ than to hear the words from Jesus Christ himself? Amen? I mean, it, get, it gets no better than that person to talk to. And so Jesus, one day before he was arrested, he's having this conversation with his disciples. And it says this in Matthew chapter 24. It says, that the, it says this in verse 3. Later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will all this happen? Follow this part. I believe it's on the screen. If we have a, a Matthew 24 verse 3, it says this. They asked this question. What sign, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world. Let me, let me read that last part again. Verse 3. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? So follow me here, church. The end of the world and the return of Christ are connected. Jesus Christ returns and the Bible says that the return of Christ and the end of the world are connected. I remember growing up as, as a child that whenever we would talk about the end of the world, usually you read the book of Revelation. I don't know how many of you have ever read the book of Revelation. It's all this symbolism, all these things that happen at the end of times. And I just remember there were a lot of people growing up that didn't like to read. I have friends that don't like to read the book of Revelation because it freaks them out. And I'm like, oh, the world's going to end. I'm here to tell you that if you're a follower of Christ and you're a son and daughter of Christ, the end of the world or the return of Christ doesn't have to freak you out. Amen? 
You want to know why? Because the Bible says that we're covered, amen? That we're covered, that He is with us, that He is for us, that He's not against us, that, 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 he's, that God has us in His hands, amen? But I want you to know this, that although we can't know the exact hour or the day, Jesus had this conversation with His disciples and He said, look, these are the signs that you can see in, around you that will signal that I'm drawing close. Kind of like this. The, the, a great way to understand this is this. How many of you know that if you go up to Sedona, maybe not so much here, but you go up to Sedona, when you see the trees and the color of the trees start turning, you know, from green to orange or brown or yellow, you understand that what's happening, right? The time is changing. It's a sign that the times are changing. Here's another example. A, 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 a mom, right, a, or, or a soon-to-be mom. She begins to show her pregnancy, right? And then in that fourth or fifth month, right, you begin to see, oh, that, that, that woman's expecting, right? Just, just a caution to you guys, never go to a restaurant and ask your server, are you expecting? Because you never know. She may say, I'm not even pregnant. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Had a friend of mine who did that, never went back to that restaurant ever again. But when you get to the seventh month, you get to the eighth month, the ninth month, right? What are the signs that she's about to give birth? Well, her body's hurting, her back is hurting, her body. You know, all these things are a sign that the baby's about to be born. In the same way, Jesus gives us things that we can look at to see he's about to come back. And this is something that, that you and I, we have to be aware of. That Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's not, he's not coming back Listen, he's not just coming back to visit. He's coming back to, to gather his people, to gather those who are his followers. He's, not, he's, he's here, and, and he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna come, and he's going to return, and he is going to take care of business. All right? Now, here's what I, wanna, I want us to see, and we learned this two weeks ago, but how can we know? What are the signs that Jesus said? So let me just quickly go over the ones that I talked about two weeks ago. And I'm not going to get into them because you can go back and listen to it. It's online. The first sign is this. In verse 4, in Matthew 24, he says, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. So the first sign is people are deceived. People, are, they walk in deception. They, they, they've been lied to. How many of you know that we're living in a time where there are a lot of lies being promoted all over? Amen. On social media, on the media, it, you, it's, people are being lied to. They're, they're being lied to about their gender. They're being lied to about their sexuality. They're being lied to about marriage. They're being lied to about family. They're being lied to. And, and so what's happened is, is that there's a, there's a deception that has, that has infiltrated the hearts and minds of people. And who is the author of deception? And who is the father of deception? The Bible says that the Satan, Lucifer, the devil, if you want to call him El Chamuco, I don't know what you want to call him, but he is, he, he is Satan, the, the liar of all liars, the father of all liars. He is the father of deception. And the Bible says that here's the first sign, is that many will be deceived. The second one is that there will be war amongst the nations. We talked about this two weeks ago. Church, we're living in a time where, like, like never before in my lifetime, never before in my lifetime has there, is there such a propensity for war. We've got conflict in the Middle East. We've got conflict in Europe. We have conflict going on in, in, in the continent of Africa. We have conflict going on in the Pacific. We have conflict even going on in South America. All this potential for conflict, all this potential for wars and aggression like never before that's what we're seeing in our time. The Bible says the third sign is natural disasters. There will be famines in many parts of the world and earthquakes as well. That's what we see all along, uh, all around the world. Number four, persecution of believers. The Bible says in verse 9, Then you, believers, followers of Christ, will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. Now, we don't see, we don't see the arrest and persecution and killed as much here in the United States of believers, but we do see it in, in other countries. We do see it in the Middle East. We do see it in Asia. We do see it in other countries that are not predominantly Christians. Where, where I, I mean, you can go and you can read the stories. You can hear the testimonies of, of pastors and believers that have been arrested and then thrown into jail and persecuted and even killed. Now, here's what I would say to you today. 
we, we may not be suffering like others suffer around the world here in America, but I will say this, is that the Bible says at the end of that, it says that you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed, and you will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. I want you to think about this for just a moment. What would happen today, or what would happen this week, if you went to your school campus, or you went to your job, and you professed to everybody, and you just said, guys, I am a believer of Christ. I believe what the Bible says, and I just want to be, I want you to know that I'm a child of God. How many of you would be celebrated, and how many of you would be persecuted? How many of our students would be persecuted in their school? How many of them would be ridiculed? Huh? I mean... We see that happening all around us. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, it says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. And then he says, be happy about it. I want you to think about this. How many are happy that you've been persecuted? How many, been, how many of you are happy that you are made fun of? How many of you are happy that you are hated? The Bible says that Jesus told his followers, be happy, be very glad. That's crazy, isn't it? The Bible says, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. My friends, if they persecuted Jesus, how will they not persecute us? It may not cost us a lot to come to Christ, but to live for him, it costs us a lot. Now watch, this is where a lot of people turn away from the Lord. Because they want all the benefits of being a Christian, but they don't want the responsibility. Come on, what's the benefits? Eternal life, forgiveness, the love of the Father. All that is great. But with those benefits, watch, come responsibility. What's the responsibility? I will live for you. You are my Lord and Savior. What you want comes first. I die to self and live for you. What did Jesus say? If anybody wants to be my follower, you got to pick up your cross and you need to follow me. See, see, a lot of people don't like to hear about the cross. They like to talk about the cross of Christ. But do you know that the Bible talks about a second cross? And that's your cross and my cross. That, that it's not done about us being saved, but it's about our discipleship. It's about following Jesus. And watch, when it gets hard, a lot of people flake out. Because, oh, we, we like to feel good in the sanctuary on Sunday, but when we're persecuted on Monday through Saturday, now that's too hard. Or, or when there's conflict at home, and it's easy to praise God and worship Him on Sunday, but can you be godly, amen, when there's a little bit of conflict and strife between you and your husband? Someone say amen. Someone say ouch. Huh? Can you still remain Godly, can you still remain committed to Christ when your kids are driving you crazy? Hello, somebody. Can you still remain godly when, when you're a son or a daughter living at home and your parents aren't believers and you still have to obey them and honor them? And you say, well, they're not Christians and they don't know. Are you still honoring? Come on. And what happens, what happens is verse 11, what's it say? It says, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many. The reason people turn away from the Lord is because people show up in their lives and want to teach them something that isn't scriptural. Something that contradicts scripture. Follow me here, church. Because the, the church, see, what we want to do is, is a lot of times it's very easy. It's very easy for us to... To try to win people and say, come and experience God's love. And yes, that is true. Love changes us and love transforms us. But watch this. But here's the thing is, now when transformation has to begin to happen in some of our habits, in some of our thinking, now all of a sudden we don't like that. God, you can have my life, you can have my heart, but don't touch my habits. God, save me from hell. God, be my Lord and Savior. No, we don't even want God to be Lord. We just want him to save us, but we don't want him to be Lord. Because when Jesus is Lord of our lives, guess what? What you want and what I want doesn't matter anymore. It's, he's Lord. We don't understand that here in America. You want to know why? Because we have a very independent spirit. We have such an independent spirit. We wrote a document called the Declaration of Independence. Come on, somebody. We're, so, we're not going to bow before anybody. And then you come to church and we say, surrender to God. We don't surrender to anybody. Come on. And so then when, when, when that happens in our lives, then guess what? 
Then we want to uh, treat Christianity like a buffet. I, well, I, I agree with this, but I don't agree with this. And then we pick and choose. Well, what things will apply? And so what ends up happening is, is that when you hear something, some of you are getting a little uncomfortable right now. You're like, Ugh. you're squirming a little bit. You want to know why? Because truth is being applied to your life. Truth is being applied to your life, but that truth is not meant to hurt you. It's not meant to destroy you. It's not meant to pick on you. It's not meant to make you miserable. The truth that is being applied to your life and to my life right now is meant to set us free. It is. But watch, in our human nature, we don't like it. Like, Pastor, who told you what I was doing? Some of you think of that right now. Who told you? Who told you I was struggling with this stuff? And then what ends up happening is to justify yourself and to justify your actions, to justify your mindset, to justify your behavior, you then look for somebody who will come and soothe you and, and confirm, affirm what you're doing. Come on. You already know who you can go to. Right? Like if you're upset and you're, you want revenge and you want to hold bitterness, you know who you can call right now. <laughs> right? You're not going to call Pastor Rosie, right? You're not going to call Pastor George to affirm that, that attitude in you, but you probably call your crazy cousin Maria. <laughs> because she's a little, she's a little, come on somebody. And she's bitter, and she's, she's been walking in, in, in bitterness and resentment. And you know what she's going to do? She's going to amplify what you're feeling, and now you're going to feel justified. And so guess what? That crazy cousin who misled you, who caused you to deviate, has now watched become a false prophet who's deceived you. Come on. Man, that's... I'll preach that next week. <laughs> the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, it says this. It says, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Let me stop there for just a moment. Sound and wholesome teaching. You don't want to hear sound and wholesome teaching anymore. You don't want to hear, watch this. It says they will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject truth and chase after myths. So watch this. You reject sound teaching. Can I tell you something that here at Lifeway Church, we have a sound teaching that comes straight from the word of God about marriage. Did you know that? Hey, do you know who designed marriage? God did. So why not do it the way God created it for? We have sound and, and wholesome teaching about family. We have sound and wholesome teaching about finances. We have sound and wholesome teaching about your thought life. We have sound and wholesome teaching. Come on, somebody. We have sound and wholesome teaching about these different areas. We have sound and wholesome teaching about gender. We have sound and wholesome teaching about sexuality. We have sound and wholesome teaching about every aspect of life that you could ever imagine. But see, what happens is the enemy comes in and he, he does what Satan did in the, in, in the Garden of Eden to, to Adam and Eve. He comes in like a snake and he says this, did God really say that? Did God really say you have to change? Did God really say that this is the only way you could experience life? Did God really say this about marriage and this about family and this about gender and this about sexuality and this about money? And all of a sudden, watch this, you, you got to be careful because you receive that and like a seed and that seed then grows into a weed. Come on. Okay, no one's saying amen. It's all right. I'll say amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Pastor, you better be careful. You're going to be having church by yourself in there. Uh, if I'm going down, I'm going down with the truth. <laughs> Not with a lie. The Bible says, I know, I know this hurts. It's like, it's like, Pastor, do you know this is online? Yeah, I do. 
I, I mean, this is the truth. This is the truth. And, and by the way, this is what I'm coming to understand, guys. Everyone understand. Junior, this is what I'm coming to understand, brother, is that a lot of people, even if they're not safe, they think like this, but they're afraid to say it. Because they get persecuted. Now, I want you to hear this from my heart. I'm not going to use this Bible to bash anybody. I'm not going to use this Bible to condemn anybody. That's not my job. I'm going to use this Bible. Watch this. I'm going to preach the truth. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit apply it to your life as, as he wants. But my responsibility is to apply this truth to my life. My life. See, the Bible says, here's another sign. sign. It says, sin will abound. Listen to what it says in verse 12. It says, sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. I want you to see that, the, the, the progression of this verse real quick. It says, sin will be rampant. In other words, it will grow. It will abound. Sin will, will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. You see, what, what, is, what is sin? That's not a word that we talk a lot about. In the, it's not a word that's used a lot in, in, in society and culture. You want to know why? Because if, if there really is, listen, if there really is sin, then that means there's a payment for sin. Come on, okay. You ready? If sin, if sin is real, that means that God's penalty for sin is real too. So so what has the enemy created to offset sin? He says this to you. He says, everyone has their own version of truth. You have your truth, and your truth is your truth, and that's your experience, and no one can take that away from you, except is that what if that truth that you espouse to contradicts the Word of God? Who's right, you or the Word of God? Watch this. So what happens is we begin to shift the truth according to our behavior. Come on. And the Bible says, watch, what is sin? Sin is simply when we deviate from God's will. Do you know that God has a will for your life when it comes to, to, to your family, to your marriage, to your finances, to your job, to your, to your emotions, to your relationships? God has a will. There's, there's, a, there's a will that he says, this is the way I want you to do it. Now, you say, what? This is really deep, guys, but you got to hear this. Many years ago, I heard this story. I heard this story about, about a dog. They, they, they wrote, a, they wrote a, the, an article in a Canadian newspaper. And in this Canadian paper, they found out that dogs were mysteriously disappearing from this community. And so they didn't know why they were disappearing. They had an idea, but they weren't sure until they finally observed it. And what happened was is that this community, they, the dogs were in a fenced area, right, in, a, in, the, in the houses. Because it was kind of like an, out, uh, an outskirts, right, of a community. And so check this out. They found it and they observed this where, where a wolf, a wolf would come to the fence and antagonize the dog to get out of the house. And the dog would bark and bark and bark. The wolf wouldn't do anything, just one wolf. And, 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 and what ended up happening is the dog would get so agitated that he would find a way to cross the fence. And when he crossed the fence, what would happen is the wolf would then run to the woods. And the dog, being a dog, come on, would run after him. When he got into the woods further away, the wolf would stop. And guess what was awaiting the dog? A pack of wolves. This just goes to show you, watch, when you escape the boundaries of God's protection, you then find yourselves in a pack of wolves. He draws you out. He, he draws you out. Come on. Instead of running to the church, to the house of God, some of you run into the wrong person. Some of you run into the club. You run to the, to, the, to the bad habit, to the vice, and God is saying, you're out of my protection. It's not that I can't protect you. It's that you rebelled against my borders, my parameters, my boundaries. And when you escape that boundary, guess what? Now you're susceptible. That's how sin works. Sin draws you out. And sin never looks bad. Come on. Have you ever noticed that? Sin never looks bad. Sin always looks really good. You want to know why? Because if sin looked bad, none of us would want to do it. Like, oh, come on. I don't want that. But he makes it look good. 
Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed? Have you ever heard this? That everybody looks good in the club at 2 in the morning. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but now the lights are on at 7 in the morning. You're like, hey. <laughs> Someone say amen. Someone say ouch. Some of you are like, I've been there, Pastor. <laughs> Some of you, you're like, I was the ugly one back. No, no, I'm playing. <laughs> but what should we expect? Watch this. So sin has grown. And so what's, what's the effect of that? The effect of that is that love has grown cold. As sin increases, love grows cold. Do you know the Bible says that Jesus said these words? He goes, in the last days. He said, in the last days, he talks about that, 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 uh, that fathers and, and sons and mothers and daughters will, will, will be at odds. They'll hate each other. They'll be against each other. Isn't that what we're seeing right now? We're seeing, we're seeing, I mean, I just heard a report this week of a father who pursued his wife and his kids. He pursued and he murdered them. His teenage sons, all because of an argument. I mean, how does that happen? How about all the violence that's happening, happening in our society? Listen, the, the violence that we see with, with, with students acting out on their teachers. They're, they're literally attacking their teachers in school. What about all the violence of, 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 a, of, a, of a police officer sitting in his, his squad car and someone just coming randomly and shooting them behind the head? What about all these things that are happening in our society? Is, is, aren't we seeing that the love, that love has grown cold? You want to know why? Because we, you remember when sh uh, sin used to be shameful, but now it's celebrated. You know, notice that? Like, what do you mean it's celebrated? It's applauded. People put, put sinful acts online they put it in the social media, TikTok and, and social media. And guess what? Like, 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 click, 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 follow, follow, follow. There's stuff online right now that years ago it would be like a shameful to put on. And I, don't want, I don't mean to sound like an like a old fogey or whatever you want to call me. But how many of you know that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong? But we've lost that boundary. And you know what? It's like... We don't, want, we don't want to tell, we don't want to have these hard conversations. As a pastor, I'm going to stand before God one day. I, the Bible says I'm going to stand before God one day. And you know what God's going to ask me? He goes, did you do right by me? Did you tell them what I told you? Were you a good pastor? Were you a good, did you give them the word? And I, I'm not perfect, but I'm going to sit here and say, God, I preached the Bible. I didn't compromise. I told them. Now, if, now, if you listen, that's on you. But I'm going to stand before God and go, I did what I was told to do, God. They made me didn't like me. They made me walked out of my service. They made me blocked me on Facebook, on Instagram. Some of you are like, what's Facebook? Hey, hey, IG and, and all that stuff. Hey, listen, I don't care. I did what I was told to do. So, and, and so one day you're going to stand before God and you, you're going to go, well, God, I didn't know. He's going to go, no, you do. I remember you on that day, April 28, 2024, you were in that church, Lifeway Church, and there was a pastor there who was telling you, and he told you, and you're like, oh, yeah. I, 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 I. It's too late. It's too late. The Bible says, here's another sign that the gospel will be preached around the world. The one who endures, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world. So all the nations will hear it and then the end will come. And so this is important to us because, first of all, I want you to see this. When it talks about, you know, that the, the gospel will be preached around the whole world. Check this out. Like never before, we have tools to preach the gospel to, around the world. We have live stream. How many of you know that? There's these things called, called viral moments, right? There's a lot of stuff going on around the world. And so watch, we, we, we here at Lifeway, we're online. We have people watching from all over the world. Now, how many are watching? I, that's none of my business. I'm just putting it online for people to, to, to hear it. Amen? 
And so watch this. So, so the Bible says here in verse 13, it says, but the one who endures. Everybody say endures. In other words, the one who doesn't give up. The one who doesn't turn away. The one who, who, has, who, who has perseverance. Perseverance, excuse me. I was, I was talking to my wife this week about some, some people that I discipled many, many years ago, over 20 years ago. I, I, was, I was with them, or I was talking to them, and then I began to ask them. I began to say, yeah, I, I said, um, how are you guys doing? I said, are, are you guys still involved in, in this uh, type of ministry? And they says, oh, no, we don't do that anymore. And I broke my heart. I broke my heart because I already, I, when, he, when this person said this, I knew what they were saying. They were saying, like, I'm not involved. I'm not giving anymore. I'm not serving anymore. Whatever. I don't know what the case is. But here's what I want you to hear this is like, why didn't they endure? Why did they give up? Can I, can I speak to young adults and young people right now? All the young people, young adults right now, listen to me. It's cool that you're coming. It's great that you're coming to church here as a teenager, as a young adult. But it's not about how fast you take off. It's it's about are you still running 20 years from now? Are you still being faithful 20 years from now? Are you still being faithful when you're in your mid-30s, your mid-40s, and now you're teaching your kids what you learn? Don't, don't, don't throw in the towel. It was just too hard. And no, no. If it's too hard, it's because you're doing it in your strength. Let God do what he needs to do in your life. Amen. Here's, here, I'm almost done here. The Bible says that Jesus will gather. He will gather his chosen ones. And, and let me read this next verse to you. I think it's uh, found, let me see, in verse 30 and 31. It says, and then, then, the la- and then at last the sign of the Son of Man is coming, will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among the peoples of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Here's verse 31. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his what? His what? They will gather his chosen ones. And it goes on to say, from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now check this out. There is a teaching right now, or there's a belief that that a lot of people ascribe to that is not scriptural. It sounds good, but it's not true. It's not scriptural. Jesus never said these words. Are you ready? Here it is. We're all God's children. Do you know that's not true? We're not all God's children. Well, at the end of time, whenever, whatever happens, anyway, we're all God's children. No. You only become a child of God through Jesus. By accepting Jesus in your heart. See, people, people want to use that saying because it makes them feel good. Well, because it, makes, it, it, it absolves them from having to make a choice. I can keep on living the way I live because, after all, we're all God's children. That's not true. We're all God's creation. But we only become his children when we say, Jesus, come into my life. Jesus said these words in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Except through him. He didn't say, I am one of many ways. That's another lie. Oh, there's a, there are many roads that lead to God. That's not true. You want to know why? Because in no other religion did the that the founder of that religion or faith, whatever you want to call it, no, no one ever came back from the grave except Jesus. No one. And you're like, well, 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 that's debatable. I don't know. I mean, I could be, I don't know if that's true. Okay, my friend, let me, I've said this before and I'll say it again because it bears repeating. Let's just say, my life, I get to the end of my life, and I die, believing that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, and that there is a heaven, and I believe that, and I live my life that way, I try to be good to my wife, I try to be good to my children, I try to be good to people, and I get to the end of my life, I die, and then there's nothing, and I'm, I'm just a bag of bones, come on somebody, I'm just whatever you want to call me, a pile of dust, whatever. Watch, what will I have lost if what I believe is not true? I've lived a happy life. 
I've lived a good family life, a good married life. I've, I've tried to be a good person, moral to people. And I get to the end, and it turns out that there is no Lord. Now, I believe that there is 100. You want to know why? Because he changed my family. Because he changed my dad's life. But I get to the end, and he's not, he's not, it's not there. What will I have lost if I'm wrong? Nothing. I will have lost nothing. But watch. Let's say you're here today and you say, oh, pastor, dude, you are crazy. That's a fairy tale. That's not real. That's for the weak-minded. That's for the people who, who can't think for themselves. You've drank the juice, bro. You've, you're poison. You're weak mentally. Watch this. Watch. And let, that's, say that's the way you think, that none of this is true. And let's say that you get to the end of your life and it turns out that you're wrong. What will have you have lost? Huh? See how heavy it got in this room? See, everything changed. You guys were all laughing earlier, and now it's like, oh, shoot, that just got real. <laughs> You're not here by accident. You're here because the Lord destined this moment for you to hear this so that you could say, I need you, Lord. Because here's my last point. Here, here's what I want you to know. Is that one day Jesus is going to come and gather his chosen ones. Here's the thing is, no one knows when that's going to happen. No one knows the hour of the day. Let's put up that next verse. Listen to what it says here in this next verse. It says, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. So, so I can't tell you, hey, on, by this date, by this time, that's when the Lord is going to return. Because here's what would happen. If we could know the exact date and time, you want to know what we would do? We would party like there's no tomorrow, and then right before that minute happens, okay, Lord, I get saved right now. I wouldn't do that. Yes, you would. I think all of us would. Come on. So watch this. No one knows the day or the hour, but... Here's the final point. You must be ready. The Bible says in verse 42 and 44, it says, so, so you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day the Lord is coming. You must also be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. We have to live every day like that day can be the day. If you Listen, if you knew that Jesus was coming tomorrow, how would you live today? Who would you reach out to? to reconcile with who would you need to forgive or who would you ask to forgive you who would you share your faith with the question is not is Jesus coming back here's the real question are you ready hey guys thanks so much for watching we hope you're blessed by today's video don't forget to like subscribe and follow our social media platforms in the description below. God bless.